I'd like to welcome you all to this meeting of the Sustainability Advisory Board on Monday, August 3rd at 6 o'clock or thereabouts. Um, technical difficulties, folks. Um, calling the meeting to order, I see the first thing that we have added to our agenda tonight is election of chairperson and vice chairperson. Um, do I do this, Brandon, or do you? I deflect to Stephen. <laughs> Brandon, I think a plan commission. I think Mark did it, so okay. Um, yeah, I think you can probably do it. Okay. Stephen, do you want to join us so you have a mic? Um, or not? I'm okay back there because I try <laughs> to kind of let him. Okay. I don't know what the proper terminology is for. Usually, you just take like nominations. Okay. Just so just call for nominations from the floor. Okay. Nope. And <laughs> three times and then see what comes up. Sounds good. So we will take um, nominations for, I suppose we're doing both of them, correct? Is there two of them on there? Yes. Yes, both chairperson and vice chair, but you have to do them separately. So we'll do the vice chairperson first. Doesn't matter. Okay, let's do a call for the vice chair person. If we wanna start with our, to my left here. <laughs> He's Not here from board. transit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're um, from transit? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I will nominate Michelle Mutzel. Uh, Vic, do you want to go next? I second the nomination for Michelle. Okay. Also for Michelle. Brad, Bob, do you want to weigh in? No? I will support that nomination. <laughs> Michelle, will you accept that nomination? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> then you just call, motion. Yeah. Yeah. call for Definitely. a vote on it, an actual vote. So we can uh, vote on Michelle being Michelle um, Bogdan, is it Mute Mutzel? Metzel. Metzel as the vice chair. All in favor? All in favor, say aye. 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 The vote passes. Next, we will vote on uh, a chairperson for the board. Okay, would anybody like to make a nomination? Nominate Margie Davy. Okay. I will second that nomination. Brad or Bob? <laughs> Support. I like the thumbs up. Hey, that's up. four. Uh, Margie, do you accept the, uh, or we got to take a vote? No, you ask accept. me if I accept, oh, the accept the nomination, and I do. Okay. Now we vote. Uh, anybody, everybody in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, vote passes. Okay, but next year we're going to have some more nominations. I just want to warn you. <laughs> and Michelle agrees. <laughs> Okay, well, with that out of the way, um, we do have Please make a point of order. Yes. Thank you. Um, Michelle Mutzel is the chairperson and the vice chairperson. Yes, Bob. In fact, I was just going to do that because we do have a new board member tonight that no one has met yet but me. So we will um, start with him, and then we'll introduce the rest of us to you, too. Bob has been on the board in the past, but it's been a few years um, since you were on the sustainability board for us. So um, I'd like to introduce Ken Osmond tonight. He's, this is his first meeting, and he's uh, going to be on the board for the next three years. And he is also our sustainability board, I mean our sustainability um, he got an award at State of the City last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it feels like last year. It was on March 2nd. So anyway, um, and then after he accepted that award, we went, oh, wait, we should invite him to be on the board. Um, we did also, on the same day, um, lose one of our board members. And by lose, I'm sorry to tell anyone who hasn't heard yet that Lerton Blassen game did pass away on March 2nd or March 9th. So our last meeting was on March 2nd. State of the city was on March 9th. 
Um, so we are happy to, very happy to welcome you, Ken. Um, we do still have one more opening on the board. If anyone out there in TV land is interested, please, please go to the website for the city and apply. Um, we, we like having people on here, so. Um, let's go on around the room with the board members then for Bob's benefit. We'll, we'll um, go first to, oh, well, Ken, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're interested? Sure. Um, Ken Osmond, I'm the CEO and owner of Punnett Perk Coffee Houses. We have three locations here in town and uh, one food truck. And our goal is to be, the, be a, a model for business sustainability. And so we're, I'm just looking forward to partnering with uh, the city and other businesses in the community to uh, kind of extend the philosophy. And obviously he's already got a really good start on that. He's, um, I had stopped in there for something a couple of years ago and was immediately impressed and went back and talked to him a couple more times and that's how he ended up getting the nomination for the award that he won. Okay, going on to Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Crute. I work at Mercy, and over the past 10 years, I've worked on sustainability projects there in one form or another. And this uh, last May, I finally managed to finish up my bachelor's in sustainable studies from Superior. So, you know, that there wasn't enough going on with the pandemic, I decided to take a full boat of classes. <laughs> Congratulations on your graduation. Exciting. Um, my name is Vic Oliver. Um, I have a degree in conservation and environmental sciences, and I was the first education coordinator at the Menominee Park Zoo here in town, which is how I got onto the board. Um, I still serve on the Zoo Society's board as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Margie Davey, and I know you know me. So let's go on to Brad. Brad, are you still there? Can you tell us why you're interested in this board? Absolutely. Um, I may periodically shut off my uh, camera just because I tend to get a little bit better audio that way. So just, just a heads up. I'm still here. Okay. Um, my name is Brett Spanbar. I am the Campus Sustainability Officer for UW Oshkosh. So obviously the connection between the university and the city is an important one. Thank you. Michelle? Seems to me that Michelle was on the board when Bob was on last too, but go ahead and tell us about you. <laughs> uh, I actually don't know if Bob and I were on the board at the same time. I think we might have just missed each other. Um, but yeah, I've been um, passionate about sustainability for a long time. Um, I got a bachelor's degree that's basically in environmental advocacy. Um, and. I have been doing a lot of volunteer work for um, Friends of Menominee Park Shoreland, um, and I've been sharing that for the past uh, five years. Um, so yeah, I have, I have lots of interest, and so that's why I'm here. And Bob, we do have other members who weren't able to make it tonight, so we'll introduce them next time or whatever. Okay, moving on. Um, the approval of minutes, which goes way back to March 2nd, any of us who were actually here for that meeting, um, that would be me and Vic and Eric, you were here, I believe. And that's all of the people that are present tonight mm -hmm. that were at that meeting. So um, would one of you like to make a motion to accept as written? Motion. Or change? Oh, to accept. To accept? I'll accept. Okay. Second. Second. Um, I did see one thing that we'll need to change, Brandon. I noticed under seven, that's a Roman numeral seven, that should be Ms. Oliver, not Mr. Oliver. <laughs> Good catch. Sorry about that. I think it's funny. I found it and Vic didn't, so. I just don't care. <laughs> Other than that, everything was like, okay, that was a long time ago, but that's mm -hmm. what we did back then. Okay, all in favor of accepting the minutes as written? Aye. <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on finally, and thank you guys for bearing with us. Um, we have Jim Collins and two of his closest friends here tonight from the Transit Center, and he has a presentation for us on hybrid bus procurement. 
Tell yeah, us more. Uh, I don't have a formal presentation, but um, so I'm Jim Collins, Transportation Director, and Steve Thomas, X, my Operations Manager, and then uh, Brian Griesbach oversees our maintenance as well as our street painting and sign divisions. Um, so they're just here if you have any specific questions. Um, however, uh, we have a unique opportunity this year um, in this Ironically, it happened about 10 years ago, but in different circumstances where um, traditionally we're not able to afford to buy something like a hybrid bus because they're so much more expensive than a clean diesel bus. Um, right now we can get a clean diesel bus for about 450,000 and a hybrid bus is about 750,000. So traditionally, we haven't been able to afford those unless there's a grant available that pays for the cost of the buses. In 2010, we did get a grant um, that paid for 100% of the hybrid buses. So at that time, we got four hybrid buses. Um, this year, we have another unique opportunity. We were fortunate enough to receive quite a bit of CARES Act funding. Um, we received about four and a half million dollars in CARES Act. Um, Initially, that's to respond to the pandemic for some of the things we're experiencing, like loss of revenue and additional expenses. However, even after that, we think we'll have enough money left where we can do a few capital projects. Um, and we laid out kind of our plan to council at our um, capital improvement budget meetings and then also um, internally prior to that. But uh, related to the buses and why we're here is because one of the projects that we'd like to pursue is to purchase two hybrid um, buses with our next procurement, which our procurements for a, a transit bus take about a little over a year. So if we ordered a bus the end of this year, it takes, a, by the time we go through pre-production, production, they're built, they're custom built basically from the frame on up. And it takes a little over a year to, from the time we start the procurement till the time we get it delivered. So our goal would be to order them end of this year. They would produce them towards the end of next year and we get them delivered in 2022 and they'd be replacing those 2010 buses. Um, fortunately, we have a grant already to replace two of the buses that um, with clean diesels that we got previously. Um, those are paid 80% federally, 20% locally. This CARES Act funding, the thing that's unique about it, it's 100% paid for federally. So there's no city investment. So when I presented this to um, the city manager and our finance director, as well as our, our transit advisory board, they were all supportive of um, pursuing the hybrid buses because even though they cost an extra 250, 300,000, there won't be any city share. So we're, we have an opportunity to get the hybrid buses and not increase the city budget at all. Um, so that's pretty exciting and unique for us. So I'll just go through some of the highlights, but basically um, wanted to come and present it to you guys and get your support for it um, if you're in favor of that. Um, I, I put this in, I believe Brandon put it in your packets, it's just kind of an outline, so I won't read the whole thing. Um, but basically um, with the hybrid buses, currently we do our procurements through, we buy off a state contract. The state contract currently has three options. They have um, clean diesel, CNG, and hybrids currently, and that's about two more years left on that procurement. So we can purchase off that contract. They've already negotiated the prices with our bus manufacturers. It saves us a ton of time and effort because to put one of those together for a transit agency our size just isn't feasible. We usually have to piggyback on or buy off a state contract because just putting together a procurement for something like that takes three to six months um, and a lot of manpower. So that's the other plus to this is it's already on the state contract, so we can get a hybrid and it's buy off that contract. Um, something other, something else that's interesting, our 2018 and 19 clean diesel buses are actually performing better than our 2010 hybrid buses. The technology has just advanced so quickly each year that currently we're getting about a mile and a half per gallon better on our new clean diesel buses than we get on those 2010 hybrids. So the technology is continuing to evolve. They're also much cleaner every year. Um, they're called clean diesel because they actually have a system now that burns the exhaust or cleans it before it goes out the smokestack into the air. So they're a lot more cleaner than they used to be as well. Um, but like I said, with that CARES Act, we have the opportunity to test some of the new buses and see how that technology is advanced and how that would work for us. Um, for instance, Eau Claire, they're, 
I've talked to their transit manager and they said that their new hybrids, um, I think that's a little high, but they're saying they're getting about 2.8 miles per gallon better than their diesel buses. Now their diesels are a little few years older than ours, but um, I think that might be a little high, but anyway, we'd like to kind of see how the new hybrids perform versus the clean diesels. Um, and then I know I've presented to you this board in the past, I think it's been a few years, but um, generally the question comes out up about electric buses. And why don't you pursue that? And we are interested in that. Um, however, there's a few issues with it currently. Um, right now they cost about a million dollars. You know, where we can get a hybrid for 750, we can get um, a clean diesel for about 500,000. So they're pushing the million dollars and then you need some electrical infrastructure as well. And we just, we don't have the budget for that currently. Um, but in addition to that, they haven't really been that well tested yet. Um, I think possibly in the future that uh, like, like all technology, as the technology gets better, the price is gonna come down. So after this procurement, our next procurement won't be till 2025. I think by then we'll have a better idea. The price will come down. We'll have a better idea of how they perform. They haven't really been well tested in northern climates. Duluth just got some about a year ago. Madison's in the process of procuring a couple this year. Um, and then La Crosse ordered a couple. I think they're getting delivered next year. Um, so. By the time we get to 2025, I think we'll have, the price will come down, we'll have a better idea of how well they're working in northern climates. Um, right now, from what we've seen, they don't have uh, the, they don't hold the charge to last all day. So that right now, our buses, when they leave the garage, they run for the full 12 hours. So you'd have to charge it somehow in between and you'd have to somehow figure out some infrastructure. That's one of the things we're looking at, also with the CARES Act funding, is upgrading our downtown transit center. and. We're looking at a short-term plan and a long-term plan. That's something that we're gonna consider if there's a way to add any charging infrastructure there. I don't know if it'll be within our budget this time around, but it's something that we're interested in. Some of the other things, you know, they're in, this is probably neither here nor there, but the electricity right now, most of it is um, generated by coal, by burning coal. So there's a debate how clean that actually is. Um, but like I said, by 2025, I think we'll have a better idea of if that works in cold weather, weather climates, I think the life of the, or the extension of the battery will be longer. And I think we'll be in a better position then to evaluate um, if we wanna pursue that. So at this time, we're just asking for support for the two hybrid buses because we are gonna um, spend about, like I said, 250,000 each more. So it's about a half million dollars more to get the hybrids than it would be to do the clean diesel. but. It'll be a good opportunity for us to test them. So I can answer any questions. You kind of already answered mine, but so we got about a 10 year lifespan out of the first set of hybrids, correct? But you're anticipating about a 15 year lifespan for this group, right? Um, at, no, at, well, the, so the, the, life, the life cycle of a, a heavy duty transit bus is 12 years. Okay. So the 2010s, that's why if we start the procurement at the end of this year, we're not going to take delivery until the beginning of 2022. Right. And we can't, because it's federally funded, we have to use the bus for 12 years. Okay. Um, so the ones I'm referring to in 2025 that will replace then are actually two, we have two, two 2013 buses that will replace in 2025. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was just curious, I think you referenced lacrosse. Mm -hmm. uh, and you were a little bit suspect on the amount of the increase in performance. Does that have any relationship to how new the vehicle is? And would they, did they communicate to you they expect that to degrade at all over the lifespan of the 12 years? Right. Yeah, that's actually Eau Claire that has Claire. the hybrids. They gave me the data, but the hy their hybrids versus their um, diesel. And they are, there is like a two, three year gap between their, the newer hybrids and okay. their clean diesel, so like I said, that could have something to do with, I mean, it obviously has a little bit. Okay. But they, they're, they run similar to us. They run a, a few more hours, and it, Eau Claire's a little bit hillier, but again, that's, I guess we're uh, splitting hairs at that point. I okay. They're similar size system. Okay, any questions from at home? Okay, seeing none. 
Um, this doesn't even call for a vote on our part unless you want us to vote for support. Yeah, I think it would help. So then when the procurement goes to council, the transit advisory board um, supports it. So then obviously, you know, we can say we presented it to the sustainability board, advisory board, and they supported it. So that helps us explain why we're spending an extra half million dollars. <laughs> so. Well, and I do remember the last time you came, Jim, I think we'd asked you to come in and explain why we weren't considering electric buses. Right. And um, all of this is, is the same thing, except it's getting a little closer. Yep, exactly. So we'll just be patient. I do have a question. Are, you, are there any upgrades to the transit um, where the buses are stored and stuff and where they would be charged? Is there anything on the, on the horizon for that? Yeah, there isn't currently. Um, I know we, we've, obviously, we've looked at electrical buses over the last five years. Um, we had some thoughts that if we upgraded some of the electrical in our building that we could char possibly charge them in the building, you know, with uh, the plugins. Mm -hmm. However, we're, I don't know, Brian, if you know any more about that, but we're a little skeptical if that's going to work. Yeah, I think that would have to be addressed by uh, uh, Dan Kushman. Um, he's our electrical guy at the city there, and he would have to address those issues as far as the power that it would take to supply the charging uh, equipment for the buses itself. Yeah, we, we talked to him about it about three, four years ago when we first started looking into it. Um, and he did say, you know, it was feasible, but they were going to have to do um, some extensive upgrades to wherever we would charge that bus. So, but no, we don't have funding to currently do that. Whenever, um, if we did get a grant for electrical buses, we'd include in there the upgrade to the infrastructure. Okay, the reason I was asking was we have been, prior, prior to March, we were discussing um, working with a solar energy company that wanted to use a city building sort of as a pilot project for us. And so, but that was on a grant basis that rolls around like every six months. So we'll have to get back in touch with them if we're gonna be meeting again and see where we're at with that process, but maybe we could collaborate on that and, it would be good for the city and it would be good for the buses and that way it wouldn't be as costly and wouldn't be coming from coal so sure. yeah. so, but we'll keep you posted on okay. that you'll be the first ones we'll ask okay. <laughs> um, well then I guess I would like a motion if someone's willing to make it to um, support the current plans that the transit system has for the buses Um, I move to support the uh, transit department on their hybrid bus procurement. And a second. Okay. Thank you. Is that you, Bob? Yeah. I think so. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. Great. All right. Well, thanks for your support and, you know, keep us posted and we'll keep you posted on our plans as we go. Super. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks, Jim. Thank yeah. you. Thank you all for staff. coming. Minor point of order. Am I allowed to vote second or? Yes, absolutely okay. can. Yes. It's just, I know you have it. <laughs> There's no official. Like, <laughs> you haven't officially been sworn in, which is true, but you, we are counting you as a board member tonight. So. Okay. I just don't want to do out of, anything out of step. We're pretty <laughs> casual. I'm sorry, I should have thought to mention that. Okay, moving on to community composting with UWO. Oh, Michelle, you're up. I am. So um, this is something that I just wanted to, um, it's more informational and in hopes that more will be coming. I know we've talked a little bit before about the possibility for the city to do some pilot tests with the um, UW Oshkosh biodigester um, and to eventually work towards um, composting or um, you know, bringing our organic waste to the biodigester um, from the municipality. Um, and we have been looking uh, on campus for grants to be able to do something like that. So um, this is more kind of bringing this back to the foreground and hoping that um, we can, that the sustainability advisory board, if we can work with the city and with the biodigester to perhaps 
um, move towards a grant that could help us move in that direction. Um, Brad is also working on that, obviously, um, in his position uh, for sustainability um, at the university. So um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, Brad. Um, yeah, I guess I would. Uh, the one comment that I would have was that um, the the one grant that we were looking at pretty seriously was the USDA's Community Compost Heat Waste Reduction Grant, um, and so that's something that I think we are very much still interested in pursuing. Um, but it's but it certainly requires us to have a city or county partnership as the main recipient. Um, and so it would obviously, you know, having a good um, connection at the city to ensure that all of the proper um, parts are in place is really crucial to making that project come to fruition. Okay, so will you be able to um, tell us at some point what it is you would need from us? Yeah, I mean, I think um, we would we would need whoever you know sort of the the, the needs to be involved um, people from the city. Um, that's probably going to be through the folks who are involved with uh, sort of like waste management planning and those those types of things. Um, I you know I certainly perceive this this body of folks as being ones who could could review. Um, uh, the project and and give again kind of a vote of confidence or of approval. So if, if folks have other connections, um, that makes sense for us to maybe have a meeting um, down the road. I know we are we're kind of on a rolling basis here. We're we're basically just kind of trying to figure out what what steps do we need to take now so that we can better plan to um, apply for this grant in the future. Ask, as well as keeping our eyes peeled for other grants. Can I ask a question? The nature of the cooperation between the city and the university, is it to set up the city to be a central collection point for multiple end users within the community and to be able to create, move that central source to the biodigester? Is that the nature of the pathway for this? Um, so my understanding is that the grant is basically to um, encourage composting on a community level. Um, and so I think that means residential as well as from businesses. Um, and the point is to basically reduce food waste going to landfill diversion, right? Increase landfill diversion um, and move that food waste into a better, you know, sort of end use. Um, certainly the biodigester, um, you know, kind of tackles that in two ways. One, it is creating a material that can then be created, uh, turned into compost, but it is also producing um, renewable electricity. And so I think that kind of, um, there's, there's two aspects there that are really beneficial. As part of your grant process is creating that uh, life cycle flow and connectivity between entity Part of the grant process um, and is there any kind of scaling that you have to do for community uh, breakdown by business or residential um, I'm, I'm really not sure um, I'd have to go back and look at, at the grants a bit more in detail and, and kind of piece that part out sorry for the questions I'm just trying to catch up here and Right now, I drive 210 miles to get rid of my compost. <laughs> so this is sort of near and dear to about 10 local businesses who would really like to not have to do that. So Yeah, um, so I know right now we are also currently uh, developing some strategies for us to start some of this process, particularly from the business um, side of things so that we can that the biogas program at UW Oxford can directly partner with um, local businesses to accept and collect their food waste. We're, we're hoping to launch that in the next um, couple months, if not within the next month. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any questions at this point, other than what we've had? Well, could you repeat the name of the grant? 
Yeah, it's um, the USDA, it's CCFWR, Community Compost and Food Waste Reduction. Thank you. Okay. And, um, just to, to kind of add to um, what Brad said, um, this project would be something that would need to be piecemeal. The first part of it will probably be, you know, sitting down to the table, actually figuring out um, logistics and things like that and doing planning. Um, and there would also be likely smaller pilot scale um, projects that we would do and just it would be more incremental. Uh, because there are a lot of steps and a lot of things that we have to do to try to reduce contamination um, for what would be going in there. So hopefully that helps answer your question, Ken. Yeah, it, it does. Okay, so this is kind of an informational item at this point. Um, it sounds like maybe Ken and Brad might want to do some more talking too. Um, not to exclude you, Michelle, but it's that would make three on the board, so we can't do that unless we make it a subcommittee, which we could do if if you feel the need for that. So, if well, that's okay, I, I'm fine facilitating that connection, and then <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, if you know, if you decide you want a subcommittee or something, you just let Brandon know, and he'll take care of that. I mean, we just did piece mailing number one. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Okay, then. Um, I think this requires no further action from this board at this time, but we can keep it on the agenda for further discussion, right? That takes us to rain barrels, and we have two very exciting things to share about rain barrels. One is that we have partnered with the Oshkosh Housing Authority and have supplied them with six barrels at this point and are working with them to um, see that there's some education and some installation components that go along with those barrels. Not all of those details have been worked out yet, but I've been working with um, Justin Mitchell on that and he says that they need to be finalizing the locations for those and want to host a day with residents and interested community members to have the barrels painted, maybe have a local artist included. And um, we do have, the, he believes that the site that's been designated will be able to do this with like 15 feet between groups. So um, this should work pretty well. It is an area that also has a native prairie. So that's what they would be um, working for the, the rain barrels for, watering with them, I guess I should say. Um, so that is one project that is in the works. And then I think I'm going to ask you, Vic, if you don't mind yeah. to share about. Definitely. Um, so one of the items on our goals um, is a lot of educational programming and in the past we've done a lot with rain barrels. Um, we did a rain barrel workshop last year um, where we procured some rain barrels and then helped local citizens to um, turn the physical barrel into a rain barrel um, and then gave them instructions on how to install it in their place of residence. Um, this year, thanks to the pandemic, that isn't really a safe choice for us to host people in an enclosed space. Um, so Pat has um, connections with her church, church at First Congregational Church um, and has asked that I do a virtual rain barrel workshop for this year with them. Um, that doesn't mean that that couldn't be shared on our Facebook page or with others via the city website, what have you, um, but that's kind of our first step. So I will be demonstrating um, the benefits of rain barrels, um, where they can get the supplies, how to build one. I will not be building one myself, um, but that's kind of what we're working with for this year. Excellent. And that may deplete our current stock of rain barrels, so maybe yes. then we'll have to get some more. That's kind of the goal, right? Keep yes. those babies coming. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. The next on the agenda is the duck ordinance for discussion. Um, I can give you just a tad bit of background about why this is here. It's, um, I, somebody did reach out to me and 
they expressed an interest in having ducks. Although we have a chicken ordinance and um, at this point we do not, it specifically excludes waterfowl. However, people who raise chickens have also found that raising ducks um, could have many benefits in that the, the ducks are very different critters. Um, obviously they are, but they're, because they don't have the sharp beaks, sometimes people prefer them more, especially if they have small children around. The ducks that would be included in a duck ordinance um, would be heavy, um, they're, they're called heavy, heavy barreled, I forget what it's called, um, ducks, and that's not an insult to them, it just means that they're too heavy to fly. Heavy bodied. Heavy bodied, yeah, that's better. <laughs> So heavy bodied ducks, um, which means they can't fly. So there aren't um, some of the issues that we had had with the um, chicken ordinance in, in determining, you know, just how high of barriers. Um, yeah, the barriers would have to be and everything. So I put together some information and that's what you got in your packet. I should ask if anyone was able to access that through the packet. Did anybody actually look at any of that? And it's okay to say no, I understand. That's a one, no. Okay. I, I actually had trouble accessing it through the city site. Um, I couldn't get any of the links to work. Me either. Okay. So. I can um, send out an email to everybody after the meeting with this page on it. Um, That'd be great. Cause, That'd be cause good. Because it is just a Word document, so I can all the links should work within that document. Okay, that'd be great, Brandon. Yeah. Okay. Um, in which case, we may want to just... Um, put off our discussion on this for a month so that we can can look at that. Even though I had provided you with the links, um, I don't I don't know where I got them anymore, so I didn't sure. end up reading them closely enough either. I just know that this is probably something that if we can accomplish it over the winter, that would be good. Um, ducks do winter very well in Wisconsin. They prefer marsh hay and just want to hunker down in it. They go in at night very happily because they don't want to get picked off by predators. And so they kind of put themselves to bed in the marsh hay. And um, that just a light in there is enough to keep them warm for the winter. So anyway, there were many reasons to consider the duck ordinance and really didn't come across anything that would um, prohibit it except our current ordinances. So. We'll, we'll pass that on to next month and we'll all have a chance to study up on it then. Is there any DNR position on that? Absolutely. Uh, um, hold on, Bob, just a second. Um, Ken had a question first. I was just uh, wondering what the DNR position is or is that part of the packet or something we need to research? Um, frankly, I don't remember seeing anything in there about that. So it's probably something we need to add to research. Thank you. The, the things that immediately come to mind is that a duck as a species is a migratory bird traditionally and thoughts that come to mind of people accidentally releasing or intentionally releasing certain types of animals into wild populations and so there well, might be some advice and guidance. The ordinances that I've, I've seen very sp limit them very specifically to certain species of ducks, certain breeds. I don't know what the right word is, but for example, mallards, you can't do this with because they right. fly and, you know, and they're migratory. So it would be very limited to the type of ducks that you had. Right. So that's kind of all part of the whole program, I think. But I didn't think to ask what the DNR would say. Um, Bob, you had a, a thought. Sure, it wasn't necessarily a thought, just a question. Would we be amending the existing ordinance that is, that's on the book? I think we would have to do an actual duck ordinance, but it would also require um, altering one of the current ordinances. I believe it's the one about animals because it specifically says no waterfowl. Okay. Any other questions for, for now? Okay. See none, let's move on to, oh, electric, oh no, permanent, nice try, Marty. Hmm. Um, permanent community gardens. 
Um, this, again, is something that's been discussed many times in the past. We have had, the, the Sustainability Board has supported some community gardens um, on city-owned property in the past, but they were all temporary. They were known that they weren't going to be ever actually become permanent. Some of the issues with a permanent community garden is um, what if the people who start to take care of it and establish it and everything move away or get tired of playing with in the dirt or whatever, you know? Um, what happens if, if it starts to become overgrown and nobody's taking care of it? Um, so that is the main issue that seems to pop up with it. Um, on the other side, you know, people are having a lot more time on their hands. For example, this summer, we hope this doesn't go on for too long, but, and there have been many, many requests to have some permanent gardens within the city limits. The Redevelopment Authority did take a look at this um, at their last meeting, I believe, and um, I, I haven't seen the recommendations or anything that they've given to us yet, but I know that they are having discussions along the same lines, I guess we could say. Um, they would not be doing anything about creating gardens. That would kind of fall to us, maybe working with the neighborhood program or one of the neighborhoods or something mm -hmm. um, to create a permanent community garden. But um, at this point, it's kind of all just in discussion. Um, I don't know, Bob, if on the council you've heard anything else about um, Katja, <laughs> um, <laughs> if you've heard anything else about um, using city land for a permanent garden, or has, has that come up at all yet? Um, or recently, I should say. So I'm definitely in support of this stuff, partially as a as, uh, um, property manager within the housing authority, I actually support and help create several community gardens on our properties as well, on a permanent basis, and now I've the luxury of watching our residents maintain them and utilize them and cook from them and grow from them. So um, without any involvement from me anymore at this point, <laughs> it's a very, uh, very self-sufficient process. So I would want to indicate that I'd be willing to, to work on this and to further this uh, as, a, as a member of the Sustainability Advisory Board if, if the board wanted me to do that. Definitely. Excellent. Are there any criteria for community gardens that have been established, discussed, you know, such as within poor neighborhoods on bus lines so not people without vehicles can utilize them you know how much square footage volume you know those sorts of things has any of that been established or i mean there's still... there's been scientific studies that have talked about um mental health increasing when you are you know outside more frequently or your land you know the more green area that's within a city we could include gardens within that that, that conversation um i think what i was getting at is, is like as a sustainability board and as a community if what is the ask on the city what are, what are the specifications for the ask and potential grant writing in the future to sustain those and i think that's the point of this discussion okay that's yeah. why it's a discussion yeah. item on the agenda is we get to make that okay. as we continue this discussion around this topic okay. And we do have some guidelines that we've included in the sustainability plan, Ken, and I know you don't have a, an actual copy of that yet, sure. um, but there is a whole section in the sustainability plan on local food, and community gardens are covered a little bit in there, not as specifically as some of the questions that you just raised, but, um, w and we'll need to pull that out and look at it. You know, this meeting's been kind of weird, frankly, because we haven't met for so long, and there were a lot of things that have been thrown at us in the last six months that we hadn't, nobody has had a chance to talk about. So I almost view this meeting as more of a planning session for us for next month or the we're, next month or whatever. And I mean, we're kind of whizzing through them too, so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we are. So, I mean, we might, um, 
in the future have to maybe think about just putting a couple of these on the next one and then tabling them and then talk about the next ones in the next meeting so we can maybe have more lengthy conversations about a workshop or have a workshop or after a workshop. yeah right which is one way that we've worked really effectively in the past with um, specific issues and I mean we have the board goals to look at today too and that's going to be more of the same thing just mm -hmm. seeing where we're at now and what we want to do in the future and it varies a lot depending on who's sitting on the board too and what their interests are and what they're willing to work on so we may have some whole new views here which would be great um, while I'm thinking of it Brandon will you be able to get a copy of the sustainability um, report um, plan to, to Ken yeah we can get a probably a paper copy to you it is available online if, if you wanted to navigate to it um, but I'd maybe send him that link for yeah no problem yeah. Um, I actually just posted it on the on Facebook today mm -hmm. oh <laughs> see it um, but I can send you the link Ken for that thank you and then also we'll work on get you getting you a paper copy of it it's I don't know how many pages it's well, lengthy well this thing it is lengthy <laughs> but usually are. it's a book yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and normally you know sustainability we shouldn't be using the paper but it is very handy to have it available that way to look up a lot of things and to make notations on so I'll defer to Stephen that's we can get him a copy of that correct mm -hmm. okay <laughs> okay um, are there any other questions that anyone would like to raise on a permanent community garden idea that we might want to research before next month again this is something that it would be really nice if we could get it done say by February so that it could be established for next year and I think we're probably going to have to bring in the neighborhood um, people too to help us with this. Probably population density and walkability within like a certain range. I mean, not everyone's got a car, and people want, like you said, it's right. kind of usable. So I don't know. Best line the highest, the highest population access. density areas in the city versus available lots. Well, and how close how far away they are from a food desert or whatever yeah. too uh, right it's a lot of the same questions we had to ask with the co-op Ken right right um, how is that going to happen so and I'm, I'm also curious about things that might need to be researched in terms of you had mentioned abandonment yes if there's any potential crossover with the parks and rec department for community involvement and or management of said spaces so there was an abandonment of of public space there's an abandonment of a garden oh uh, or to actually avoid or mitigate the possibility of abandonment is having the parks and rec build a program around community community gardening such that it can be in, involvement participation can be sustained and then if a, a garden is potentially abandoned is that something where you can at least do a reset of the gardening space with the help of the parks and rec so I think you know on the conversations I've had internally um, it might be best and, and you'll have to tell me if I'm if this isn't the, the, the correct group to do that but for exactly what you just described some type of some sort of a plan that we would maybe propose to the Parks Department because um, the conversations that I've had thus far would is kind of what Marty had explained right in the beginning that the the overarching I don't want to say fear but you know is that these won't Concern. be maintained and then the parks department would then be having to go you know to this little lot here to this little lot here to this little lot, and they don't really have the time or money to be um, tending to those lots like that well and that's I think where the um, collaboration with the neighborhood associations may be a benefit too mm -hmm. However, the neighborhood associations don't necessarily overlap with the areas that may be most in need with of a community right, garden. Right. So yeah, we've got a lot of um, we we need to get a lot of questions answered on this before we can move forward. I think with Bob it. wants to share. I think he does, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Um, forgive me, I'll take a leave for a moment uh, from this part of the conversation, but I'm leaving on the tail end of a conversation about the collaboration of parks and rec and creating standards for that uh, for community gardens. And I actually uh, was part of the Stevens Park Association 
uh, several years ago. Um, I no longer live in that neighborhood anymore, but I, with the Neighborhood Association, created a garden, a community garden in Stevens Park. Uh, the rules were created by the Neighborhood Association um, and were accepted by the park as, as certain rules and everything, and the expectation is that um, that was that if the park, if the land ever stops to cease as a garden, um, the, the, the park would immediately consume that, that area. So, um, but there was um, a great amount of effort put into creating the rules of that neighborhood garden um, as it related to the use of the park as well. So, some of that work's been, been done for us already. We just need to maybe resume uh, conversations around that and to uh, see if it needs to see if it's a model that works in other neighborhoods that have community parks. Yeah, I think within a within a established park already, it it would make things easier for, for from from their department standpoint. Correct. True. Um, I'm not sure that I want to even recommend that we give up any of our parkland for community gardens, though. Right. Parkland is so hard to come by in this city, and we're already um, way below what we yes. should have per capita. So. Anything else? Um, anything else on this that anyone would like to share? Okay, then, I think we'll move on. We're doing that moving on thing really well tonight, folks. Um, Eric, I see that you and Pat were going to give us an update on electric vehicles in mm. Pat's absence. Have you got anything you'd like yeah, to share? Yeah, she's found some grants that are not open right now, but will be available later on this year. I think three, if I'm not mistaken, that she's looking at. Or yeah, I think there, there's quite a few that she found that were open, but none of them are open right now that we'll have to work on later on for like infrastructure integration. Uh, as far as electric, um, there are quite a few smaller ones that could be you know, integrated, like replaced with electric vehicles. Um, a couple in the fire department, a couple in the water department. It, no large fleet changeovers unless you're counting in the police department itself. So what we really need is a grant for Tesla's for the entire police department. Right, but the, well, another thing that's risen, I mean, since the last time we met, there's been kind of a very large societal shift as far as views of policing and everything also. And this how we're going to integrate police in the future in the communities which I don't know if Oshkosh has talked about how they want to go forward in the future on that, but something like that sort of puts up, you know, integrating electric vehicles. We don't want to buy, you know, 50 squad cars if, you know, there's no, they only need 25 next year. Or, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, obviously, mm -hmm. but, yes. but it sort of changes the perspective and buybacks. And if the be, like I know a lot of, uh, funding a place they want to talk about doing the social workers which would fall more on Winnebago County as opposed to the city itself um, okay so as far as the um, electric vehicles go at this point we just have some grants we can look at in the future and we don't really have any new recommendations for anything or anything to move forward with not at this point because we would be okay. picking out a single vehicle out of a single department Got it. As opposed to an entire fleet so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, could I ask a question? Yes. So what's the downside to just getting one fire truck, for instance, be that you would also have to invest in infrastructure, could be able to afford that with the grant and then just use this as a you know trial. Oh, we have this one fire truck that's electric and then hope to get future funding that could support more of them? Or are, are departments not really interested just because it would only be one? That, that was probably, the, probably the biggest hurdle of it all, is buying a single one-off and putting infrastructure in for it, is to get over that first hump, so to speak. And the original scope of my idea for all this was to have the city uh, put forth some sort of legislature of some sort of saying that if vehicles are available, either hybrid or full electric, that 
the fleets would have to be replaced with that as opposed to traditional diesel or gas burning. And I got pages and pages and pages of the various vehicles that we have in the city. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there, there are a lot of vehicles that, that can happen with, but it would be one or two vehicles in Perfect a certain program. department. Now, if you're, you're talking about a full fleet exchange over, we'd be looking at something uh, a smaller scale like the fire department, not necessarily trucks, but uh, personnel vehicles. Like, um, sure. I'll say shift commander type vehicles like the SUVs and everything. And as far as the Oshkosh Police Department, that would be more of a large scale changeover to electric or something like that. But it's, there are small integration points, but I'm not certain where the city would feel about putting in thousands of dollars worth of you know, infrastructure for a one-off project. Like if I want to take a single, you know, Dodge Neon from the water department, would they be okay if I switched that car out and then had to have this person parked at this place every single night? And Yeah, I mean, I know um, within our department, um, back in March, I had applied for a grant from the state for, it's part of the VW mitigation program the, from the diesel gate. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that's... That money would be, um, if we did it, you know, for instance, get get that grant money, it would be used for the public infrastructure. It would be used to provide, you know, electric vehicle charging stations for our public lots or something of that sort. So I don't know if that's the first step. That's what I was thinking too, is that it probably makes the most sense for us to have the city make charging stations available for the public use because that's what's really driving electric cars right now. And then from there, we would be able to, to you know, get some statistics on usage. And then we could see how much of the community is, you know, in tune with using that type of um, fuel source. Or lack of fuel. Or lack. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that fossil fuel stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a lot of smaller inroads that the city could make, but it's the whole question that the city would want to actually put the time in for a single vehicle of the water department here or a single right. uh, command vehicle here, or would they want to do more of a larger overhaul, so to speak? Well, let's wait and see what... Which comes down to money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Michelle? Sorry. No. Um, wouldn't it make sense then to look into what the city needs to do to invest in infrastructure first, even just like for municipal use? Because if the infrastructure is there, then we can make that gradual replacement. Because I don't see a magic time when we're going to have enough money to replace everything at once. But this is the way that we should be moving as a city. I think we can. Yeah, that's what. That's, that's probably. That's what Pat and I, that's how we got hooked up on this, because she started with the infrastructure end of this with the solar questions, and I had started the electric vehicle questions a few months before that, and we just kind of merged, merged the two together, and we're here where we are today. Okay, I think we can save that for future discussion, too, um, since we're kind of... Yeah, I mean, to finish, it's, you know, a lot of it is, like Michelle just kind of said, it's, it's all expensive, and a lot of the funding that's available um at least that i've seen in the short time that i've been in this position it seems like it's more geared towards the public side um so i don't you know i don't know if that's if that's uh where it starts we've already kind of gone through um with the fellow who they mentioned earlier you know where it makes the most sense and where it's actually even possible as far as adding those charging stations in public lots Mm -hmm. um, and we even categorize them with easiest to not easiest as far as, which means cheapest to do to <laughs> not cheapest to do. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's all kind of still just in purgatory until we hear back from, from that grant process. But, um, okay. So yeah, another thing that we can, yeah, that's something we could, you know, kind of when we hear back, we'll, I can bring that to the board. So great. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on then to the Menominee Shoreland Restoration Program, Michelle. How's that going this year? I think it's going fairly well. Um, we 
obviously haven't been able to really get out as much this season. Um, it's been a little bit more difficult um, just coordinating volunteer days and getting people out there because typically the way we do things are we work with local nonprofits to have people adopt a day uh, where they're going to take their group there and then we have multiple people in the city, multiple groups of volunteers that kind of help us uh, maintain um, the sites. But uh, due to COVID-19, um, we just haven't wanted to get groups together because commonly they don't have tools or we're lending tools and gloves and things like that. So um, it's just not been something that we feel comfortable um, doing um, this year, at least with the uh, adopt a work day kind of a thing. Um, so we've had kind of a smaller scale this year, but we've still been able to go out to both the Miller's Bay site and the Pump House site to kind of take a look at things. And I keep seeing new or exciting um, native species that are there at the different sites um, or see ones that we planted, you know, two years ago that are finally coming up for the first time. So um, I think uh, it all looks pretty good. Um, the Lakeshore Trail um, is overgrown a little bit, so we are slowly working at that because if you leave it alone for a week or two, the plants just all crowd in and go to the space where all the sun is. So um, <laughs> that is a work in process if you do go out there for that, but we are um, really paying close attention to that viewing area so that when um, people want to enjoy that bench um, and that little area where they can enjoy it. Um, um, well taken care of. Um, we're also, I'm going to be giving um, a virtual talk about the Shoreland uh, sites on Sunday, August. Oh gosh, I have the page up a moment here. Sunday, August 16th, I believe, at 1 p.m. with um, the First Congregational Church, again a virtual one. Um, much like Vic mentioned earlier for um, her topic. So, yeah, that's exciting news as well. Maybe somebody from there will decide they need to come help you weed. <laughs> I mean maintain. I meant to say maintain. Yes, yes. Well, part of that maintaining is definitely pulling weeds. So um, <laughs> it's, it's all part of it. They like to creep in there. So. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Do you know if you have to be a member of the church to see the virtual? Never mind, I'll ask somebody from that church. That would make more sense. <laughs> uh, if it is open, those are both really good topics should... for us to be interested in. Yeah, and well, share. And, and to share, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know you're thinking about it, Vic. Which is our next I think Right. All righty, moving on. Are we going to talk about now? that next month? Is that going to be a next month agenda? The Lakeshore stuff? Is that kind of an ongoing one? Yeah, that's, that's kind, kind of, of an ongoing one, yeah. Okay, social media. Me again. I heard Brandon mention something about posting, so you must be yeah. giving him some stuff. Nope, nope. I nope. uh, sure haven't been. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I still just think that it's just, it's not ideal for me to write a month's worth of posts and then send them to Brandon and then have him share. And like, it's just not ironically sustainable. Like it's not how social media is meant to work, right? And that's not what we were originally doing. If you look at our previous posts versus the posts, the last few I've sent you like months ago, um, even like the number of interactions that we're having is significantly decreased. So I think there is a lot of merit to having a conversation about me somehow getting access back to running the Facebook page. And I don't know what those steps are. I don't know what the next step would be, um, but I think it's a really important conversation that does need to be had. Um, we are looking to engage more people. We have an opening on the board. Um, the best way to do that is to promote ourselves. Um, and if you go to our Facebook page now, the lack of interactions isn't very encouraging, nor is it stimulating. Um, so I'm personally a little disappointed in myself because I haven't been doing the post, but at the same time, it's not a conducive manner to running a social media page. It shouldn't be on your shoulders. Well, we've talked about it internally too, the way that that particular page is set up. We maybe need to reconfigure it because yeah. it's, um, 
it's not even easy for me as I'm at my desk to yeah. uh, log into it and then go to this other page and stuff. So we've actually talked about multiple city Facebook pages internally mm-hmm. and how we need to improve them. And, and so it's on, it's on my um, plate. Cool. But we can def. I mean, I'm open to having the conversation about, um, you know, having you ha- have more control. I don't know if Stephen can. Is there some rule that's in place that doesn't allow that currently? Yeah, or? yeah. there is currently. City manager's policy at this point. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. so we would have to go back through him. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, because he directed staff to take over admin. Got it. Mm-hmm. Some responsibility. Okay. Yeah, so um, when we created the Facebook page, whenever we did that, um, it's created through the SAB's email address, so mm-hmm. it is a SAB account. However, I was the manager, whatever term Facebook uses, um, and then so was Steven. Um, so then we could co-post, we could share. The biggest thing is like the lack of sharing from other groups. Um, that's something I really enjoyed doing from the beginning. So like mm-hmm. when the zoo first opens for this season or when you know, fellow educating groups are sharing things, we're not able to share them as much either because I'd be blowing up your email Mm -hmm. all day long with just the things I want shared. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) So like there's really great groups like Sustained Fond du Lac, which is like a citizen run group that does a lot of really great posting. They have a lot more engagement, but again, they're run by citizens only. So they don't have that governing body included. Um, So they're able to frequently post and they're able to engage in different ways. Um, some of the thoughts I have are posting more about our meetings, more of our materials, like what you did for today. Mm-hmm. Um, sharing and promoting other sustainable groups, like I mentioned, Sustain Fond du Lac is a really great page to follow as well. Um, posting more virtual classes or videos on sustainable topics as we are going through this pandemic. Um, sustainability has fallen to the back burner, I would say, of a lot of people's minds. Um, and I think it's something to stay on top of. It's, it's not, you're not enabled or unable to remain sustainable. It's just harder and it's trickier. Um, and we just need to be more clever about it. Um, so yeah. Maybe, maybe me and you can try to um, have a further conversation about yeah. ways we can maybe improve our Facebook page. We can definitely do that. I have a couple questions. I'm yeah. actually surprised I didn't know you had a Facebook page. I'm not shocked. That's <laughs> the first problem, yeah. <laughs> and uh, is that the only social media channel you at have? The, at this time, because again, it's um, party of one, um, generally okay. providing most of the things. Um, and again, because I'm not able to play the role of administrator, I have to send everything off. Right. Um, there is that delay and then there's that additional time on me where I could honestly be posting things very easily on like my lunch break um, versus spending a, an entire day creating content for a month and then pre-planning all of those posts. So it's just not set up for success at this time. Um, but ideally, I did want to create an Instagram page. That was my kind of goals. Um, as that's where I personally engage with most of my social media nowadays. Well, I was about to suggest that dinosaurs like myself use Facebook. Uh, <laughs> younger folks tend to that we want to reach and inform Correct. are going to generally be on Instagram. Correct. More. Correct. Um, and that's what I originally wanted to go towards. And then, actually, I believe it was the month that um, I was removed as admin from. Well, all of us were removed mm-hmm. as admins from the city Facebook pages was actually the month I was planning to kind of pop out an Instagram for us. So life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But and yes, the goal is to have more. I don't really see a, a Snapchat or Twitter being all that useful for us, um, but I do see an Instagram being very fruitful. Visual is probably the orientation we'll have predominantly. Correct. And because we generally do things at the farmer's market, we have booths or we do partnerships with the zoo for like bird fests and things like that. Um, Menominee Shoreland pictures, you know, the wildlife of the native plantings would be Hybrid buses in action. Yeah. Yeah. There are so many things that we could do. Um, It's just having the better access. And quite honestly, the sustainability board, when they were still controlling, when when Vic was doing the posting, um, it was very successful. We had no problems with it. Um, We did have a lot more engagement. Mm-hmm. And she was able to also tag other groups a lot more effectively so that we could yeah. get a broader, you know, get more um, recognition out there. 
it was not this board's fault no. that a decision was made citywide to not allow citizens to handle those boards. But I do um, those posts, but I do think that it probably is time that we just plain ask to have that reconsidered because it's it, it's not efficient to we need the engagement now more than ever. We're not at the farmers market, obviously, no. this year. Right. Um, we don't have some of the other avenues we had. Everybody's basically referring to social media for things, and we need to have that engagement. So, I agree. is there a middle ground for that at all? Like uh, in terms of a friends of group versus citizen engagement at large, or is there some kind of mechanism that would be? So you're asking if we could start one that wasn't run through the city, well, that talked about sustainability, or change city policy to allow for a sub-level of board role kind of thing. Yeah, I think, I personally, I mean, like, what I just think is that, you know, one ruined it for us all, and I think it's time we move past that, um, yeah. where we get to the point where, you know, there can be oversight. I'm, I'm not opposed to that right. at all. It's just giving more freedom back to the fact that we were put on this board for a reason. My specific topics here are education, and I'm being hindered in that by not being able to do these posts. Right. I, I would agree with you. A couple factors is yeah. timing is everything. Everything. <laughs> uh, there has to have a sense of urgency. Correct. Education, communica education starts with communication. Agreed. So I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you. <laughs> I think that we're all on the same page here. It is going to be a city manager decision. That's the only way a city manager could decision can be undone um, is yes. by making another one. So we'll have to um, let it stay as it is now and see what we can do about that. Yeah. And I think we could formulate a, something. We can make a plan. Something, yep, to, to provide it for uh, an ask. Yes, definitely. That would be great. And especially Hi, since. Folks. This is Brad. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Brad. You know, if we could see you, we could see you raising your hand. I know. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi, it's all right here. Um, so I, I must have totally missed this. So what was the reason for why there? Brad, I'll be happy to give you a call later and explain the whole thing, okay? Sure. Okay, sounds great. <laughs> Good call. Okay, moving on. We have our review goal sheet. Now this you did all find in the pack, right? Everybody, please say yes. Yes. Did you see our new board goals, Bob? Changed a little bit, huh? In what, 10 years? Oh, it hasn't been that long. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna skim through this. That way, if, um, Ken, if you have any questions about this, Mm -hmm. We can, if it's a long, long answer, you and I can agree to meet later or talk later. Um, if it's something shorter, we'll just go for it. And we'll see if everybody is still interested in what they were doing and if we need to add anything else. Now, keep in mind, this is our 2020 goals. We're going to redo this probably in January, as we usually do, provided that, you know, we still are having meetings in January. Yes. And so... We really only have three meetings between now and the end of the year because we don't hold one in September because it falls on Labor Day, I assume. Hmm. I see our next meeting is scheduled for October 5th. October 5th so, and I, I seem to remember that it did fall right square on Labor Day, so. Yes, the first. Because we're televised, we're not able to adjust our meetings um, beyond the first Monday, mm -hmm. so. We just drew the short straw there. Okay, so Eric um, and Brad, inventory of electric vehicles infrastructure. Do you feel that you've gone as far with that as you can at this point, or are you still working on that? No, I'm still working on that, yes. Still working on that, and you're still good with that, Eric? Yes. How about you, Brad? Are you still working on that? Um, I think my only contribution there was going to be... Um, the parking that. lot at the... Yeah, looking into the campus charging. Right. Um, and I know, and, and basically we have so few stations that they're, they are essentially always in use. Um, you know, if by chance on the weekends, folks, you know, not from campus would want to use them for, for parking there for whatever reason, um, you, would, you would pay, you know, pay the, the rate of whatever it is to, to charge there. 
Um, but kind of during normal operating business hours, um, there's enough folks on campus that they use them pretty regularly. So they would, they probably just would not be available to, you know, to folks. Okay. So that portion of it is complete, I guess. <laughs> In, yeah. Unless something changes on campus and they start adding a lot more charging stations, in which case you'll let us know, right? Yes, and they, that's come up, um, and yeah, I, I don't see that as a uh, super high priority, at this time, unfortunately. Okay. Um, moving on to number two, explore municipal and citywide use of solar energy. I know Pat is still working on that. I am still working on that. Um, those of you who were here, when um, Jane came and talked to us about um, the, it yeah, it was electric vehicles. Um, apparently she has some, some kind of grant. Pat sent me a, a note that said that there is something coming up there. So we still are definitely working on that. Um, our sustainability plan update. Y'all notice that complete on there? Ah, <laughs> oh, thank heavens. I don't know how to break it to you, but it's in 2021, we're supposed to start it. No, I'm just kidding. Oh my God, don't even start. <laughs> no. The green infrastructure audit, um, that is still on hold, Stephen, am I correct? Unless we end up with um, university students at some point again? Yeah, it's been kind of on the back burner for the time being. Okay, we'll leave that on hold then. We don't really have staff availability to work on it and we, um, and we haven't got any students coming this fall, correct? Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, his class was going to be working on something else this fall. I, I think he maybe that. doesn't even have a class this fall. Yeah, I can't, can't remember. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're leaving that one on hold. Um, fossil fuel divestment. Jake had been on here with me. Um, Bob, I think I want to call and talk to you about. Um, about that as our as our council member rep if you don't mind it's so, this this was the same fossil fuel divestment um proposal that we had made about five years ago when we had somebody else in charge of long-term finance and they things have changed a lot in that length of time so i think it's time to try that again if that's okay with you i'm going to put you down on there with me okay thank you Hey, Margie. Yeah. This is Brad. Um, I would <laughs> like to be a part of those conversations as well. Um, the so students from across the UW system have recently formed a um, what they are calling the UW Divestment Coalition. Um, I believe they've got about eight or nine campuses um, represented on this body. Is it is entirely student led. Um, they have been in talks with folks like the president of the University of California system about a divestment campaign. Um, you know, some of these uh, some of these uh, colleges that have much much larger um, endowments certainly than than we do. Um, but regardless, um, you know, they they are these are students who are very actively taking you know. Um, a very stepwise approach to a successful divestment campaign, and I would, I'd love to kind of. Um, I think I think there's some good overlap there for kind of how to approach. Super, and I'm glad to have you on there, Brad. Thanks. I got you down. Um, number six, we've basically already discussed, so we're going to skip that one for right now. Number seven, explore potential for use of permeable pavers on various sites. Basically, all of us were working on that. Margie, Vic, Brad, the staff, and the full SAB. So a lot we, of nothing. we probably should, some of us maybe should do something with that. Yep. Um, <laughs> because the, <laughs> the person who was most involved in that thought at the city left, um, it kind of got pushed back a little bit. So I mean, I can just say when we have conversations with residents that are putting in patios um it's you know it's always you push in permeable well, papers we, 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 you, pro you provide that as an option i mean i always try to say it at least in my sure. conversations that it's 
available you know do you know what this is i mean we're not recommending anything but i know you really can't but you can certainly make them aware of it restricted because of the code and sometimes mm -hmm. their only option is the permeal paper so so maybe we need to look at some of the code too and see if it needs changed because i know about, how they love that i'm sorry who, who's the most knowledgeable about, about permeable pavers Who's the most knowledgeable? Yeah. Like on the board? On the like city, the board, anyone? Um, at this point, we don't really have an on site expert. expert that I'm aware of. Just passion. Yeah. And Google. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to be involved in that, Ken? Yeah, I would. Um, Perfect. Well, good, because you're on here under SAB anyway. So, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's just an interesting from an infrastructure standpoint, both for downtown businesses especially uh, and those who have sort of patio areas and their mm -hmm. establishments things like that mm -hmm. and, and parking lots right that's where they work the best because that's where the speeds are lower and so there's not I mean it's it's tougher to make a to build a super highway out of them because anything over like 45 miles an hour they tend to lift up but Clearly, you shouldn't be going that fast in a parking lot. So, but a outdoor patio area is a perfect example where they would be potentially nicely used. Right, especially when they're near dense tree areas uh, on some private and public properties. You don't want to destroy root systems and deny water to those things. So, a permeable system would be much better. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'm going to put a star by that one. It seems like it has a lot of interest. Um, okay, then moving on to education and outreach. Um, so, Michelle, I'm thinking we've gotten absolutely nothing done on that native plant brochure, am I right? Oh, you're right, Murphy. I think we left it at, um, you know, I don't know if you sent me what you had worked on previously. Oh, so this is back on me. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that note you wrote back up. Okay, I'm writing me down next to this too. Yes, we will have to take a look at what we had previously and then see how we can include what the students gave us. And we need to pull right. the information out of the zoning, um, the new zoning code too. That has a whole section on native plants, um, which I have a copy of already. Okay, coordinate SAB's facilitation of rain barrel workshop. Hey, we're working on that, cool. Be virtual um create annual report which was actually done for the state of the city and don't have to do that again until next year brandon cool and then it'll be a 2020 annual report um support menominee park shoreland project through volunteer cleanups obviously um we've already talked about that tonight create education program for kids and public on energy composting rain gardens etc and Vic is doing that virtually since nothing else was working. And thank you so much for that. Anytime. Okay, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> um, I think that um, the recycling and cleanup that we had talked about was mainly geared at the farmer's market. Obviously, Brad, that wasn't something we were able to talk to them about this year. We we had actually planned to um, address that in later in March and the timing just was off. So I, I think we should put that on hold I agree. for now since it's not really valid at this point. The Environmental Leadership Award, we will be needing, it is complete, that's what it was called, Ken, the Environmental yeah. Leadership Award, that's what he got. Um, that was complete, but we will, be starting it again for Thank next God. year. So if anyone is interested in um, serving on a committee with that, please let me know. Um, and the plastic pledge, Vic. Yep. Hmm. Have we done anything with that? Uh, kind of hard during a pandemic to- yeah, uh, kind of knew you were gonna say that. Do that one. That was my pre-planned response. It's written down right there. <laughs> we, we could maybe go ahead and do some of the paperwork part that's fair we could talk about it we can okay so Vic and Margie are staying on that one unless yes, anybody yeah. else would like to join us you might be perfect on that one too Ken I can help okay we're adding Ken to that and who did I hear up there is that Bob Michelle who 
So okay. Um, I was just wondering um, if I can get a rehash on what the plastic pledge is. You sure can. Let me pull out my <laughs> lovely notes here. So one of the student groups. Oh gosh, what meeting is this from? from our December meeting brought up a plastic pledge proposal. Um, it's a three tier program um, that requires local, mainly restaurants and businesses to pledge to go plastic free or minimal plastic. Um, the idea was that there would be a $5 application fee, um, follow ups after six months and then annually after that to audit these businesses. Um, SAB would do the oversight um, so like the surveying, the following up, and then the idea was that some sort of decal or sticker would be placed in the windows of these businesses um, to serve as recognition and education for others. Um, that was kind of the basis of the plan. And then you can read the entire student's post on the website. On which website? Paper. Uh, ours. There is a separate website on the city site that's called um, Sustainability. It's, it's separate from the city of Oshkosh one, but it, you f access it through there. Yes, if you go under sustainable Oshkosh, under resources, it should be in there. We could probably also send you it. I can send you the link. Send him a link, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Finding anything on there. Yeah, send him a link. Yes. Okay. Um, Did that answer all your questions, Michelle? Maybe yeah, so. I think so. It's a, that would include like styrofoam, cage out containers, and that kind of thing, then, right? Yes. Yep. A lot of like straws, the silverware, the places, the place plates. I can't talk. Um, even it got into a little bit too of like napkin usage, like a uh, reusable napkin that was washed versus the like paper throwaway napkins and how many of them were being used. Um, so there were areas for it to expand beyond just plastic, um, but plastic pledge has a really nice ring to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they, she had um, given us a real good, good starting point, but mm -hmm. our job was to take it from there and, and figure out what it was going to include and not include, and then how we would implement it, right? Yes. So we could figure out what it could include and not. Mm -hmm. We just can't implement it at this time very easily. Correct, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, is there anything else anybody would like to see added to as a board goal? Or do you want to hold on to your ideas until January when we do it for 2021? Okay, I'm going with, we're holding on to them. Got it. Um, then we need to figure out our agenda items for, a, for our next meeting, which will be in October. And unless I miss my guess, Brandon probably has a pretty good list already. Um, Let's yeah. see. Yeah, so do you want me to tell you what I have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be good. Okay, so what I in, what I wrote down here was the first one that was on my list for next time would be community composting. Mm -hmm. um, we would all review the email that I'm going to send out regarding the ducks so we can click on all those different links and just kind of get a little bit of you know research done to have a better conversation next time. Mm-hmm. Um, electric vehicle project would be again on the next meeting. Do, would we want to do gardens again or not? I, and this is kind of what my com my point that I said earlier. I don't know if some of this. Do we table some of it and talk mm -hmm. about that the next time yeah. and table one of these for you know? Well, and we don't really have to table it. We can just hold on to it for well, a future true. meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the permanent community gardens. I think maybe we should put that down for November. Okay. because I think it's going to take some time for us to find out what other people are doing with that and maybe get some partnerships. And we should just probably know we're not going to probably have a September meeting because it falls on Labor Day. Right. So we'll have October, November, and okay. December yet this year. Um, the electrical electric vehicle project, could I suggest we don't bring that back until we have news about a grant and that we ask Eric and Pat to let us know when that happens. Sure. Okay, so hold for grant. Um, Michelle, do you want M Menominee Shoreland on there again next month? Yes, please. Okay. And if uh, social media could stay, please as well. I think it's an ongoing discussion. 
Okay. We can always bring up at least what we've posted and how engagement has changed or not. This is true. To be brief. Are there any other items that anyone wishes to see on a future agenda? It doesn't have to be in October's meeting, but is there anything else we should be looking at? I'm just okay, hoping. seeing none. I would say our next meeting is on Monday, October 5th, right here in City Hall, room 404. Be sure to wear your mask if we still have to or get to. And I would <laughs> entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Can I have a second? second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we are adjourned. <laughs>